Hey everyone, it's Marvin. Thanks so much for listening to Books and Boba. Uh, I just wanted to take a quick second to remind you that Books and Boba just launched our Patreon uh, to help support our future endeavors. Rira and I have been running Books and Boba for the last six and a half years, and we've always talked about wanting to do more, um, including expanding our content offerings, um, being able to go to book events, and do more coverage. And so um, to help us get closer to those ambitions, um, we started a Patreon to help us grow and to better support books by Asian and Asian American authors. We are offering two tiers for our Patreon. Um, the first is our regular Boba member coming in at $3 a month, which will give you access to our brand new Books and Boba Discord server so you can engage with your fellow Books and Boba Club members and also Rira and myself in real time. Uh, this is where we'll be aiming to move the bulk of our book club discussions. Uh, but rest assured, we'll still have a presence on Goodreads as well. And our premium tier is our Honey Boba member tier coming in at $5 dollars a month where in addition to access to our discord server you'll also get access to our monthly boba chats a bonus podcast where rira and i and some guests will get together each month and have a uh, more casual discussion on stuff that may or may not be book related as well as answer some listener q a honey boba members will also have access to a poll to help decide an official books and boba book pick uh, once per quarter so if any of that sounds interesting to you, um, support Books and Boba on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash books and boba. As always, we and I really appreciate your support. All right. Thanks for listening. And I'm on with the show. You're listening to Whoa. Hot Luck. Hot Luck. And you're listening to Books and Boba, a book club and podcast featuring books by Asian and Asian American authors. My name is Marvin Yue. And I'm Rira Yu. And this is our first mid-month book news check-in of 2023. And also, I guess, our Lunar New Year episode. Uh, Rira, Happy New Year. Happy Asian New Year. <laughs> happy Happy Real New Year. Um, it is the year of the rabbit. It is. So, um I guess good luck to all you rabbits out there. I don't know if you know, but uh, the year of your zodiac is supposed to be bad luck. At least that's how it's explained to me. Good luck. Also, I don't believe in that. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're a skeptic like me, just live your life, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, wishing everyone Happy New Year, um, you know, to go through all the New Year's greetings. Xin Yan Kuala, Happy New Year. Gongxi Fa Tsai, I wish you good fortune. Wan Su Lui, wish you many successes. And Sandy Jin Kong, um, wish you good health uh, i don't know if you have any lunar new year traditions but um i'm ready for like this weekend's gonna be pretty packed for me lots of lots of family dinners and meals in the works um i've mentioned this before in previous years like my family doesn't really celebrate lunar new year uh because we have just been a nuclear family for most of <laughs> our lives so there hasn't really been chances to celebrate with our family which is you know a very heavy part of Korean Lunar New Year uh, traditions. You go back to your hometown. You're supposed to have these big family dinners. You're supposed to uh, visit your ancestor's grave and pay respect. And obviously, when you're, you know, the only family members in America, it makes it very <laughs> difficult to celebrate. But my mom tried to make sure that we ate rice cake soup every Lunar New Year because that's supposed to be... Um, like it's because we age <laughs> every every lunar year, so every Korean like turns oh. one year older. But this, uh, but this year, I think we are not doing that because Korea is changing that custom. They're getting rid of it, so everybody is going to stay the same age. <laughs> or I guess you're going to decrease in age by by one year or two years, depending <laughs> on when your birthday is. Is this Korea just succumbing to the pressures of Western culture, or is there like just people just want to be younger? Um, I think it's it's a lot of things because um, it's it's a struggle for people who are born in December because all of a sudden you're like two years old when you're only like two months old, <laughs> and then. Um, just like schooling wise, like you don't know when you want to enroll your kid, depending on like their 
Korean age. Uh, there's also just like, um, just like social hierarchy stuff that's kind of outdated. Mm. I don't know. I'm all for let's get rid of it. It's so confusing <laughs> whenever someone asks me what my, what my age is because I just tell them. I just tell them I'm born in April 1990. That's it. <laughs> like you, you do the math. I mean, I, I feel like Korean age is very complicated for for absolutely no reason. <laughs> That's just my opinion. But a lot of people want to hang on to that tradition as well because it is like very unique. But. Yeah, that is to say, wishing everyone a happy new year. And with that, um, I guess we should get started. Um, as always, during our mid-month episode, we'll be going over the latest Asian American book and publishing news, starting with the latest publishing announcements um, gathered from Publishers Weekly and other sources. As we've done for the last few months, um, we are omitting the publishing announcements from HarperCollins as their um, publishing team is still on strike, uh, which has been ongoing for over 50 days at this point. Uh, we will be checking in on them um, later on in our new segment. But yeah, just a heads up if, in case you were expecting to hear certain publishing announcements. But yeah, um, let's get started. Rio, what's our first publishing deal? All right, our first publishing deal is Hache Go won North American Rights at Auction to Sarah Jane Ho's Mind Your Manners, A Guide to Social Fluency. Ho is the founder of China's first etiquette school and is the star of the Mind Your Manners Netflix series. The book is described to recast etiquette as a fresh, dynamic, and inclusive way for readers to thrive in any situation and transform their lives. A uh, publishing date has not been announced. I have not watched Mind Your Manners on Netflix, but you have, Marvin. I caught a few episodes um, on Netflix, and I can't say it's... Uh, my favorite show. Yeah, I feel it like when I when I saw like the teaser for it, I was like, this doesn't look like my show. So <laughs> I didn't bother. Yeah, it's kind of like a it's a makeover type show where Sarah Jane brings in clients um, that she helps um, develop their etiquette skills um, to like improve their lives, quote unquote. Um, it's just etiquette is just such a loaded term and brings it with it lots of connotations of like class and um even colonialism so it's a little it's unsettling yeah yeah but i i guess for the people who are looking to um learn that type of like upper manhattan elite class of etiquette this is the book for them i know like the go-to book for etiquette for a long time was uh, tiffany's blue book and that's like usually the first uh, Tiffany gift that a lot of teenagers receive. <laughs> and it's about like table manners and how to like make small talk. So I think it's kind of in that same vein. Yeah, I mean, the book is described as a dynamic and inclusive um, take on etiquette. So, you know, hopefully, you know, this being written by a woman of color and it being like a modernized look, it might address some of the iffier issues that I have. Um, but yeah, I guess congrats to Sarah Jane Ho on her book deal. All right. Next up, um, Scholastic bought World English Rights to Jen Pinwin's YA rom-com, Just Another Meet Cute, in which a girl tries to track down the boy who saved her from a disastrous hike and succeeds, only to figure out too late that she's dating the wrong twin. Publication is scheduled for summer 2025. Wow, talk about rom-com misunderstandings. Yeah, I think this is the first time I've heard a premise like this for the YA genre. I've <laughs> definitely seen Lifetime movies that uh, kind of fall under this uh, trope, but it's it's cool that like we are seeing it in in a YK, YA rom com setting. I'm like wondering how she tracks down the boy. Like, does she does she like go on Instagram and like just kind of like track him down that way? I mean, don't underestimate the power of a Google photo search. That's true. Yeah. That's true. There's lots it's of different ways scary. to stalk people these days. <laughs> If you know how. <laughs> All right. Next up, uh, First Second bought Lily Kim Chen's debut graphic memoir, Until We Meet Again. The book follows a young girl growing up in a loving but dysfunctional family in which an immigrant father struggles to play the role of sole caregiver while a mother grapples with her mental health. Publication is slated for spring 2025. Yeah, this sounds like a very um, 
dramatic story. And it is a graphic memoir. So it is based on the author's uh, real life experiences. And I feel like this is an experience that a lot of Asian Americans uh, do go through where your immigrant parent is the sole caregiver. And um, as we've spoken on this podcast before, mental health is kind of a taboo for a lot of Asian immigrant families. So yeah, I feel like this is a story that readers could really relate to. And um, I love that it's in a graphic uh, memoir format. Yeah, and we've seen how powerful uh, graphic memoirs can be, such as with T-Boy's The Best We Can Do. So I love how this genre is expanding. Yeah, I think it's really cool to see like more grounded stories and more personal stories in comic form. Um, so yeah, congrats to Lily on their book deal. All right, next up, Scholastic Press bought Malika Siddiqui's next middle grade book, Aini on Brand. Um, in this novel, 12-year-old aspiring hijabi Aini Zane is excited to design modest clothing for her mother's clothing boutique. But when Aini's older sister decides to take her hijab off and a boy from school gives Aini unwanted attention, Aini begins to doubt everything, her abilities, her relationships, and whether she's ready to wear hijab in the first place. Publication is set for 2024. I love the title, Annie on Brand. Yeah. Because I feel like a lot of the times we do feel like we have to stay true to our quote-unquote aesthetics. And I love that it's diving into um, just like a young person deciding whether or not they should wear a hijab. And um, I feel like I haven't read a story like this before. Yeah, I have to admit, I'm not very uh, familiar with hijabi culture in general. So I think, you know, like we've said before, books are a way for us to peer into the lives of people that we may or may not know. So yeah, it's really cool that this is also a middle grade book. So it's, you know, it's for younger readers as well. All right, next up, Jane Chen, co-founder and CEO of Embrace, sold a currently untitled memoir to Harmony Books. Chen's company Embrace sells an infant incubator that costs a fraction of what competing incubators cost. Described as modern-day eat, pray, love, the book traces Chen's transformative, globe-spanning odyssey to reckon with the ways the traumas of her past fueled both her blazing ambition and her burnout. There is no publication date mentioned. Um, yeah, modern eat, pray, love. I mean, I feel like a lot of people do benefit from reading about uh, career women finding themselves. So this is a genre that, you know, is very popular amongst primarily women readers. Yeah, I'm just glad this is a Eat, Pray, Love starring like a woman of color, actually. <laughs> it sounds like Jane goes into like her background, like growing up. I don't know what kind of trauma... Um, she went through, but it seems to be a big part of why she started her business. So, um, yeah, it sounds like it'd be cool to learn more about her company. That sounds like it's doing some really cool things on um, providing uh, better access to NICU care. Yeah. Okay. Totally agree. Okay. Next up, uh, Tundra acquired in a preempt Julia on the go, a chapter book series written by Angela on, um, and illustrated by Julie Kim. Um, set in a lively community center, a young swimmer who gets into scrapes must seek out inspiration and help from her neighbors before her mishaps land her in the deep end. The publication for the first book, Swimming Into Trouble, is slated for spring 2024, and an untitled sequel will follow in spring 2025. Did you take swimming lessons when you were young, Marvin? I did not. I, I took them later on as like a teen, which is probably why I'm not very good at swimming. <laughs> um, yeah, like my parents. I mean, the way that my dad taught me swimming was tossing me into a pool when I was three years old. Uh, and I mean, I survived, but my mom was like, maybe we should take her to actual swimming lessons. So I did like I was part of like the community centers uh, like swimming program. So like every year you would like have a swimming test and have like badges and stuff. So, um, yeah, this kind of reminds me of my childhood. But um, I did not get help from my neighbors. And uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I'm curious as to what mishaps she goes through that tosses her into the deep end. I mean, this is all just um, extrapolating from the description. But a young swimmer who gets into scrapes, 
sounds to me like she's fighting with the other kids. We can only imagine. We can only <laughs> speculate. There's only so much we can work off of. Yeah. But the deep end um, sounds yeah. more like a metaphor than the actual literal deep end of a pool. Well, this is a series. So I'm guessing that it's not just going to be about swimming. The first book is about swimming, but it sounds like the series is about uh, a young girl who is coming of age. So, yeah. yeah. Congratulations to Angela Ahn and Julie Kim. All right, next up, Disney Hyperion acquired at auction Last Hang Standing author Lauren Ho's YA debut, Bite Me, Royce Taslam. Pitched as the marvelous Mrs. Maisel meets Love Boat Taipei, this enemies to lovers novel dives into the lives of Kuala Lumpur's elite and not so elite. A career ending injury destroys track star Agnes Chan's hope of a much needed college scholarship, putting her on a journey through the underbelly of Malaysian stand up comedy and directly into the path of her arch nemesis, the annoyingly perfect, ridiculously wealthy, and disgustingly handsome. Royce Taslam. Publication is set for spring 2024. This sounds kind of fun. Um, It's always interesting to see like stand-up comedy being translated into book form. I like the fact that it is set in Malaysia. Um, I have not read Last Hang Standing, but I've heard like some nice, fun things about that book. So I'm guessing that this book will also be full of laughs. And uh, it sounds like If you love enemies to lovers trope, I feel like this is your book. (laughs) Yeah. Because, you know, if like the description of the arch nemesis here. Yeah, I I would probably hate him, too. So, yeah, (laughs) so it sounds like a fun book. Why are they always so hot? Why are they always so annoying? (laughs) Boys are dumb. All right. Our next book deal. Simon & Schuster bought debut author Robin Wesley's Dead Things Are Closer Than They Appear. Uh, The book is about 17-year-old Sid Spencer who lives in a tourist town where magic lies buried beneath the earth. But other than that, has a completely ordinary existence. Until the day her brother goes missing and the ground cracks open, unleashing the magic and dead things within. Publication is slated for spring 2024. This sounds like an adventure. Sounds spooky. (laughs) Sounds like something that I would have enjoyed as a kid because I read a lot of like spooky dark books. Yeah. Um, Yeah. It's kind of like, like books like Coraline and um, Goosebumps. Like that was kind of of like the thing that I enjoyed. Like, I don't know the vibe of that this book is going for, but definitely gives like, um, maybe this is because I just watched it this past Halloween, but like Hocus Pocus vibes kind of. That's true. I love Hocus Pocus. So, <laughs> so I feel like I would have liked this book as a kid. Yeah. All right. Next up, in a two-book deal, Disney Hyperion acquired The Last Re-Witch, a middle-grade novel by debut author Jenna Lee Yoon. 12-year-old, 12-year-old Korean-American Ronnie Miller agrees to attend summer camp to show her dad and her best friend she can be the quote-unquote normal kid that they want her to be. But while at camp, Ronnie is haunted by a Kishin and a Tokebi witch hunter who threatens them both. Publication is set for spring 2024 and 2025. Oh my god, we're gonna have Tokebi in the story? <laughs> I, like, like I have re- very rarely have seen uh, st- fiction with, with Tokebi in them. So um, I'm really excited. For those of you who are unfamiliar, they're kind of like, Korean trolls with magical clubs. So, uh, yeah, I, I love the fact that this book is going to dive into Korean, like, supernatural folklore. Yeah. Again, getting those Hocus Pocus vibes, right? Like, um, young adult, um, teen, Halloween, spooky adventures. I mean, it's it's kind of uh, it's kind of a bummer that this is coming out in spring when it should be coming out in, during October, right? I mean, it is a summer camp. That's so. true. Yeah. Summer vibes, maybe. <laughs> that's true. That's true. All right. Our next book deal also comes from Disney Hyperion. Um, Disney Hyperion bought The Sugar Plum Bakers and The Twelve Holiday Treats, penned by Patricia Tanami Harja and illustrated by Bonnie Louie, a holiday picture book for the Melissa De La Cruz studio. The book is about Sugar Plum's team of bakerinas, a.k.a. baking fairies, who make treats for kids all over the world. Publication is set for fall 2023. This sounds cute. You know, I've never had a sugar plum in my life. They're like German, right? I didn't even know 
those were a real thing until just now. Yeah, those are real things. <laughs> they're from like uh they're from like German Christmas. So I have never tried it. Um but of, of course we we associate sugar plums with uh like the nutcracker and I can see why uh it's called bakerinas because ballerinas plus bakers. So I yeah. think that's pretty cute. I mean, I've had sour plums. That's different, right? That's way different. I mean, <laughs> different. I mean, it's called sugar plum. So I'm guessing that it's sweet. <laughs> One would assume. Uh, but yeah, this sounds okay, interesting. Okay, I, I, I'm on Wikipedia right now. So sugar, sugar plum is pretty much hard candy made of some kind of small round or oval shape. And the plum in the name of the confection does not always mean plum. So it could be traditional sugar. It could have caramel or seed or nut or spices. So I I feel like the plums part really is a misnomer. <laughs> but I guess I guess they used to like use plums like preservative like preserved plums. So I don't know. This has been a that's, weird history on sugar plums. <laughs> that's good to know. Now I am more, um, I feel more cultured now. Thank you, Rira. All right. Our last book deal is Candlewick bought at auction world rights to Supriya Kelker's sem- semi-autobiographical middle grade graphic novel, Off the Cuff. Illustrated by Ani Bushrai, the book is about an Indian-American girl in small-town Michigan in the 90s, a time when becoming a part of the melting pot is one of the leading ideals. The story follows the girl as she learns to stop trying to blend in and to make new friends and find her voice. Publication is planned for spring 2026. Yeah, I I love that this is a coming-of-age graphic novel. You know, as people who cover Asian-American authors and stories you know we've seen stories like this before but um we've also had supriya on our show before she is the author of american american as paneer pie which also took place in a small town where there was a lot of microaggressions yeah and i like the i like the idea that um you know it's taking place during a time when people are you know, saying like America is a melting pot, where whereas like it's not as simple as that. So yeah, and as people cover Asian authors and Asian American stories, we've seen these stories uh, time and time again. But I feel like you can never have enough because as much as these stories are central to like our experiences here, there's so many versions of them to tell and so many different experiences. Right, Asian America is not a monolith, and your experiences differ depending on where you grow up and how you grow up and you know we we discussed this time and time again but there there really aren't enough of our stories out in publishing to begin with so more and more to add to the canon is always always great also always great to see a 90s setting <laughs> that too the 90s are back did you know that it's it's past the 90s Mark. <laughs> <laughs> i feel like i feel like at this point we're even past the Y2K resurrection. <laughs> we are veering closer to 2010s at this point. Oh God, that's not okay. I know. Yeah, I feel ancient. Anyway, that is a wrap on book deals. We're going to move on to book news. Um, as we mentioned at the beginning of the show, we mentioned that HarperCollins Union is on strike. So HarperCollins Union has been on their 51st... Or 52nd day of strike as of this point, there has been no word on negotiations. Um, It is the longest strike the publisher has ever experienced in its 80-year history. And on January 18th, the union organized a rally outside News Corp's Manhattan headquarters. And I don't know how many people showed up, but I saw on Twitter that it was a huge turnout. So it's really nice to see uh, a lot of support for uh, the HarperCollins uh, editors and uh, publishing team. Yeah. I mean, HarperCollins is fighting real hard to not pay a living wage and not to agree to better diversity practices. It's kind of like, it's real sad, right? I'm just like, they're losing so much money because 
you know, agents aren't submitting things to HarperCollins. Um, they're not getting any, like, press for their upcoming books because solidarity with the union, because solidarity with the union. And um, it's nice to see a lot of authors who, you know, were published by HarperCollins who are standing by the union as well. Um, I don't know how they're running their ship right now. They probably hired some temps with absolutely no experience in editing. Yeah, I mean, you hate to see them resort to bringing in scab labor. Um, I mean, at the same time, you can't really blame people for trying to find work and taking an opportunity. But on the other hand, um, it it is a bad look, right? I mean, they're really taking advantage of, you know, young college grads or people who love books and want to break into the industry. Um, publishing really does take advantage of people's passion and really, like, milk them for all it's worth, unfortunately. So I'm hoping that um, a negotiation will happen soon um, because $45,000 is not enough to live in New York City or even like the tri-state area. And that's usually like, I don't even know if that's starting salary, but I do know that raises are very rare in publishing industry. So even if it was like 55000 that's still not enough. Yeah. And you know, it really feels like the company is trying to wait the strike out. And it's good to see, at least on social media, that the spirits of the strike are still, they seem to still be pretty high. And, you know, I think as we get deeper and deeper in the strike is when kind of like the crucial points, right? How, how long can you sustain? Because, you know, as they're on strike, they're not... They're not getting paid, right? Because they're not working. Um, and They do have a donation fund. So if you guys are interested in um, donating to the union, I think they now have like a, a platform where you could actually send money digitally because before they were only accepting checks. But uh, you can find out more on Twitter or Instagram. So their handle is HCP Union. Yeah. And of course, they have like a bookshop affiliate uh, store as well. So um, proceeds from that would also go over to uh, the HarperCollins editorial sales, publicity, et cetera, teams. (laughs) Wow, it's a lot of departments. So it's like marketing, editorial, sales, publicity, design, and legal. That is a lot of people that are on strike right now. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah, I mean, it is one publisher, but what happens with HarperCollins will have far-reaching effects for all workers in the publishing industry. So this is something that affects all readers. So I think it's definitely something that everyone should keep their eyes on and something that you know we should all support because exploring labor is not cool. That's the official stance of Books and Boba. <laughs> A lot of publishing houses are run, or not run, but owned by billionaires. And, you know, billionaires are not by accident. They become billionaires because they exploit workers at the bottom of the food chain and, you know, high turnovers. So, yeah, if you are a company that makes millions, billions of dollars per year, I feel like you can pay your employees a living wage. Yeah. All right. What else is going on here? <laughs> All right. Moving on. Our second piece of news is Asian American Writers Workshops, digital magazine The Margins, has opened up submissions for their new notebook, uh, which is featured, which is featuring queer artists from the South Asian subcontinent and the South Asian diaspora. So the theme for their upcoming issue is Methyl, an evening of entertainment and enchantment. And Margins fellow Rajat Singh will be editing. So they are currently looking for poetry, short stories, essays, audio, video, photography, translations, and pretty much any genre blending work that falls under the uh, theme. And the deadline for submissions is February 15th. So more information can be found on aaww.org slash mehfil. Yeah, so since the theme is Mephil, um, for those of you who are unaware, Mephil is 
a festive gathering where poetry and uh, classical music and other sorts of arts is performed for a small audience in an intimate setting. So um, it makes sense that uh, Asian American Writers Workshop is looking for so many different types of art mediums for this upcoming notebook. Yeah. Um, so this is me being um, uncultured, but what is like, what is a notebook? Is is it different than like a, a collection or is it just another word for collection? It's a, another word for collection. I don't know. <laughs> there might be like a specific uh, like differentiation on it, but I just consider it to be like a digital magazine issue because okay. you know how like magazines like each issue is is different and they have like different uh different stories and anthologies so that is what i'm thinking it is um it's nice that it is featuring primarily queer artists from south asian background i feel like they don't get enough spotlight in literature so it's really nice that the asian american writers workshop is providing that space for them yeah all right. So again, the deadline for submissions is February 15th. And um, we're going to move on to our last piece of news. So Apple quietly rolled out its AI audiobook catalog, uh, which undoubtedly will have huge implications for the audiobook industry. And on their website, Apple describes their AI narration feature as quote unquote, making the creation of audiobooks more accessible to all by reducing the cost and complexity of producing them for authors and publishers. Now, obviously, automation is a very complex subject. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, especially these days with the, I guess you could call it encroachment of AI into creative arts. Um, it's definitely like, I think both you and I Rira, know a ton of people who could be like, who will be actually, who will be um, personally affected by like things like this. Yeah, I mean, like my personal take on automation is that automation is good. I mean, it helps, you know, people with labor. But the problem is how we structure labor in this country and how companies capitalize on automation to fire people and to make profit. So... Automation, definitely a complex subject, but more on the uh, AI audiobook catalog that Apple uh, rolled out. It's actually pretty funny. They plan to release this in November, but then Elon Musk and the Twitter shitstorm happens. <laughs> so they, they're like, oh, maybe we should wait. Um, but the audiobook catalog, they have four distinct AI voices. So they have Madison and Jackson for fiction and Helena and Mitchell for nonfiction. I think it's interesting that they have set voices for fiction and nonfiction. Um, nonfiction, I can understand using AI voices for because I feel like you don't need as much like... There's not as much performance like, involved, right? Yeah, there's not a much, yeah, as as performance. So there's a really good article on Slate about the possible repercussions of Apple's AI audiobook catalog. And Emily Wu Zeller, who is the narrator of The Poppy Wars, Six Crimson Cranes, Last Night at the Telegraph Club, and pretty much every single Asian American book that you can think of. We're very familiar uh, with Emily she, Wu Zeller's work on, on, on this podcast. I'm, I am very familiar with her voice on this podcast. Um, but she told Slate that by providing recordings that help AI learn to speak more naturally, uh, narrators are participating in a quote unquote another level of giving the voice away. And I mean I agree. I mean, yeah, I mean AI needs to be trained, right? That's the 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 core of like all neural networks is artificial intelligence learns what to do by basically Mimicking ingesting a ton people. of data, right? Uh, one of the one of the concerns about uh, Apple's AI voices is that due to due to the NDAs there's currently no information on wh who the voice narrators are behind the AI voices because those voices have to be like Marvin said it has to be data they need context they need uh 
real human voices to base their um, voices on. So it's kind of like the Siri situation where the voice behind Siri did not know that Apple was going to use their voice uh, and that their voice was going to be used for millions of products around the world. And they only got paid a lump sum. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, with these big corporations, like we've been like, you know, it's like we've been saying with the Harper Collins strike, if they have the opportunity to um, pay you less, they will. And they will fight for that right to pay you less. And you can say that AI narration is something that will improve access to books for people who say are visually impaired and so on. But at the same time, this can easily be a way to a Exploit take work away. Labor. Yeah. A take work away from working voice actors and narrators and be like, exploit the labor of the people they use to create these voices. Yeah. Audiobooks obviously cost money to produce, like not even just for uh, the voice narrator, but also editing wise and sound mixing. It it all comes together. It is a production. Um, and Apple's website said that publishers and authors would retain the audiobook rights and can put out other versions of the audiobook if they choose. Uh, they've reportedly approached indie publishers about narrating their books, offering to shoulder production costs while paying out royalties to authors. So it does seem like an enticing deal for um, indie self-published authors who can't afford to have a real human voice actor to narrate their books. But at the same time, I feel it is going to impact the up and coming entry level voice actors who are trying to like get their foot in in the door. And there's also like concerns that this is going to change how audiobooks are, I guess, like where like the budgeting is going to happen for marketing because you know that the high profile books are going to get human narrators, whereas like the lower, um, lower funded books are going to rely on AI voices. So it is it's another issue on classism. So there's a lot of worries about that as well. Yeah, but I mean, I think from what I've I feel like it's. Okay, like using this technology to improve like text to speech capabilities is a worthwhile endeavor, but at the same time, like it's similar to what we were talking about with like the again the HarperCollins Collins strike is these companies have the money to invest in like narrators and real life people to do these creative jobs, but you just you just know that they're going to see this technology and see ways to save money to enrich themselves. Yeah, right now, these companies are not thinking about accessibility for uh, people who need text-to-speech. They're thinking about money. They're thinking, <laughs> oh, this is content. So um, I have very little faith in Apple in um, not exploiting labor, but... <sighs> Yeah, it's it's really tricky. Yeah, especially with like, I'm thinking about, especially like all the Asian American books that we read, where the authors consciously put in like Chinese, Korean language within the book, like how that's going to be impossible for the AI to read for. I mean, accents are a thing. Also, there's a question of if there's going to be money for marginalized authors to have real human uh, voice actors. And it sucks because think about, you know, if you're a mid-list Asian American author and you have a lot of, um, you know, let's say like Mandarin words that really requires someone who knows how to speak the language and they don't have the money to get an actual human narrator who can do that. So yeah. do you settle for the AI narration that will essentially butcher your language yeah yeah and also just like we're reading Babel right now for our january book club pick and marvin and i are both listening to the audiobook 
and it has like so so much to do with language and accents and the voice actor for Babel does a lot of accents and is able to pronounce all the Mandarin words correctly. <laughs> so I like if we were reading that book with AI narration, we would not be getting the same level of immersion. So yeah. But I'm also guessing that these AI voices are very uh, they are at their rudimentary level like they're probably not as natural as they can be in terms of human speech i guess i mean i listen to my audiobooks at like 1.8 speed anyway so i mean that's the thing for like nonfiction and like self-help books i can see how like ai narration could be prioritized over human narration because people aren't listening for performance it's just like they just want to get the information as quickly as possible um but the market for fiction audiobooks, it's much bigger. So that's probably where they're going to make their money. Yeah, I think personally, if I had an option between an AI narrator and a real-life narrator, I would pick the real-life narrator every time, even if I did have to pay a little more. Um, I feel like, yeah, there's just there's so many questions, right? Like, if an audiobook is, um, is narrated by a an AI narrator is it would it be at the same price point as say a audiobook by a real narrator um how does that change in terms of like because we're also in the age right now like with like like Netflix and other streamers taking down shows permanently that like we have companies who are actively looking for ways to avoid paying perpetuities and royalties and i mean i think and maybe this is just me just becoming cynical with the way that corporations work. The opportunities to skimp and cost cut will be too irresistible for like, even if it's something that the publishers don't feel strongly behind, they're going to be forced to go with AI by the financial people upstairs because that's how they quote unquote maximize their value. Oh, capitalism is bad. Every episode we repeat this theme. Um <laughs> Yeah, but I guess I hope the audiobook industry doesn't get all like shitty about AI narrators. Um, I don't know how much hope I have for that to actually happen. I mean, it's it's an opportunity for sure, but I think my faith in them going about it in a, I guess, fair way is I don't know. I guess we'll we'll, we'll see what happens, right? Yeah, right now it's just Apple, so. It's only going to be Apple books that are affected by this AI technology, but I'm sure other audiobook suppliers are going to follow through. Although I'm not actually sure because uh, Kindle, for example, they did have text-to-speech technology about 10 years ago, um, and they had to discontinue it because of copyright Um copyright law so i don't know how apple is going to deal with copyright laws with audiobooks i mean i imagine and, they have deals set with the publisher yeah but it's also ugh, like are they going to be able to get the big five because that's it, it's a question of like do they have to go by imprint by imprint like is it only going to be indie publishers it's it's a lot of questions on how this is going to be used uh how how this is going to work legally. yeah but when you have the benefit of being one of the bigger platforms for audiobooks um it makes things a lot easier and i think for the publishers it's kind of free money right i mean yeah they don't have to pay for production costs which is you know the worry that a lot of voice actors are having yeah um also like spotify is getting into the audiobook market and that's also a question of how are they going to pay royalties for uh audio narrators and um, how is it going to work for AI narrators? It's like I said, it's the wild West. We don't know what's going to happen. Uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how it develops. I do feel like people do prefer human narrators. So there's always going to be a demand for human narrators, but it's a, but it's a question of, is it going to um, steal 
entry-level jobs and opportunities from up-and-coming voice actors. And on that note, that'll do it for our first uh, mid-month episode of 2023. Um, Once again, happy Lunar New Year to everyone who celebrates. Um, Wishing everyone a happy Year of the Rabbit. Uh, Mira, happy Year of the Rabbit as well. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And to all my Koreans out there, happy birthday. (laughs) <laughs> for i don't know if if this is happening like this year or next year with the with the age difference but i'm just gonna say happy birthday to all of us because birthdays are fun happy birthday everybody um before we go um we remind us what we're reading for the month of january we are reading Babel by rf kwang and we are reading f- books three four and five so right three four five yeah. there's not a book six right oh. so we're reading we're reading books three four five so uh, past chapter 12 yeah. to the very end and i don't know how far you're rewrote but things are getting real in fake i London. am <laughs> i am not that far since the last time we read however it like it seemed like things were going to go to shit <laughs> where I where I stopped. So. Yeah. So I am excited to see what happens. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about this at the end of the month. Um, and if you have finished the book and want to share your thoughts, uh, please let us know on our Goodreads forums. Um, as always, we'd love to include the feedback of our audience in our discussion as well. But with that, thank you for joining us um, on Books and Boba. Um, again, Happy New Year, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for listening to Books and Boba. This podcast was hosted by Marvin Yue and Ri Ryu and edited and produced by Marvin Yue. Follow the book club on Twitter and Instagram by going to at Books and Boba and engage with us on Goodreads on our Goodreads group. You can also check out past episodes of the podcast by going to booksandboba.com and by subscribing to us on your favorite podcast app. Don't forget, you can support Books and Boba and Asian American authors by purchasing books at our bookshop.org account. Check out the link in our show notes and also at booksandboba.com. Books and Boba is a proud member of the Potluck Podcast Collective, a collective of Asian American hosted podcasts featuring unique voices and stories from the Asian diaspora. Learn more about the collective and check out our fellow Potluck shows by visiting the website podcastpotluck.com. Thanks for listening. Sharon. Hey, Remen. How are folks still racist? I know, right? We're like two decades into the 21st century. (laughs) Yeah. And second question, where's my jetpack? Well, I can't help you there, but have I got a podcast for you. Modern Minorities is a show where each week, my longtime pal Remen and I uncover common and uncommon truths that we all need to hear for our majority brains and ears. Yeah, Sharon and I have spoken to doctors, lawyers, directors, climate activists, angry Asians, athletes, chefs, writers. Folks who are black, brown, gay, straight, and everything in between. Past guests have included comedian Margaret Cho, Southern Poverty Law Center journalist Geraldine Mariba, comic creator Jean Lun Yang and many, many more. We've even talked about Ramadan, Black History Month, Kamala Khan, and Robin being queer. It's like we're trying to solve racism with the podcast. Challenge accepted. So check out Modern Minorities at modmypod.com or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Remember, we're all modern minorities, but we're no one's model minority. Modern Minorities.